The A-12 program was substantially over cost and behind in schedule. Given the fact that this information was available in all three offices, why was it ignored? I don't know. Well, who would normally get that kind of information? Uh, the program office would get it, and... Uh it, it, would it normally come to your attention? Or Admiral no, sir. Morris, would it come to your attention? No, sir. You, you'd never get that kind of information? No, sir. Well, you fellas better get uh, something so the right hand and the left hand know what's going on. Back before the uh, A-12, the Navy had the uh, A-6E intruder, which it was using in Vietnam, and it was just getting old, and they decided to replace the airplane. And when they thought about replacing it, the first thought they had was, how do we get through the very dense Soviet radar network? And since the Air Force was working on stealth, the Navy, in somewhat of a competitive mode, decided to have the same thing so that they could also say that they could breach the Soviet radar system. In the beginning of uh, thinking about uh, stealth for the Navy, they came up with some modifications to the A-6 to, to make it stealthy. And they were so excited about it, uh, they had uh, various companies doing things, one of which was Grumman, and they invited Secretary Lehman to come up and take a look at it. Lehman was ready to take the A-6E, make it an A-6F, which had basically F-15E avionics, which uh, would do the job for the time being because he felt that was adequate to get through the Russian radar system. He didn't want to get into stealth until it was approved by all of the other programs that were underway at the time, which were the F-117, the B-2, and the uh, Navy's version of the F-22. And until and if stealth was a proven commodity, then and only then did he want to dump Navy money into it. And uh, Lehman's comment to me was that it looked like putting uh, fins on a dump truck and there was no way it was going to make it stealthy, that, they'd have, that the Navy would indeed have to go back to the drawing board and start from scratch. I was on the aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy for seven and a half months and I flew in every uh, plane on the deck and uh, the, the A-6 had an extra seat uh, most of the time because they were used for refueling. KA-6B was the designation. The carrier is designed a certain way to accommodate uh, uh, rectangular airplanes on its flight deck. And for instance, the A-6 you'll see on a carrier, the A-6 has its tail out over the water. Well, a flying wing, you can't do that. And so they kind of fouled up the uh, air boss who kept trying to figure out how to, how to park this if they ever did get it to fly. And as you know, it didn't fly and it was just a model and it, it never was uh, uh, flight tested. In my view, they were over ambitious with the uh, uh, design, they were over ambitious with the tech, technical details, and they had more expectations from the stealth than proved realistic. And the uh, big problem with a Navy plane when you land at 80 miles an hour on a carrier deck at full power, because if you miss the one of the four wires stretched across the deck, you have to be ready to take off again and try landing one more time on the Navy aircraft carrier. So it takes a very strong airplane. And they used to call uh, the F-14 a product of Grumman Ironworks because it was so rugged it could handle the stress of uh, being in a crash landing, basically. Well, over the years, the Navy uh, has used the fact that an airplane has to be navalized in order to fly off of a carrier, predominantly because it has to be able to catch a tail hook when it lands, and it needs extra structure and some other things as far as clearance and many other uh, modifications that the Navy deems necessary. However, whenever, a Navy, whenever the Navy wants a plane, it'll wave as many of those as it, as it wants. And when it doesn't want a plane, it uses the fact that it's not navalized as the reason. And so the Navy said, no, we need our own airplanes, which is what happened in the F-16s. They navalized the YF-17 and became renamed as the F-18. 
The idea of putting an A-12 on an aircraft carrier ignores the realities of what it's like to have maintenance of airplanes on an aircraft carrier. The seawater gets into cracks on the plane. The, the sailors are forever uh, sanding and, and uh, patching up the skins of uh, existing airplanes. And the stealth, if the B-2 is any example where they can't leave it out in the rain, for instance, uh, the stealth flying wing of an A-12 would just be a nightmare, be a headache for the maintenance people. And most people don't know this, but sailors are okay, they're great, they work their tails off out on aircraft carriers, but they're not technically astute enough to maintain the testing equipment needed for uh, an aircraft carrier, uh, the planes it has. It has about 80 planes. So what do they do? They bring technicians along, civilian technicians, they call them tech reps, and the, it, 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 the good question would be, how could we go to war, for instance, if the t civilian tech rep says, I'm not going? You couldn't tune up the airplanes, you couldn't tune up the engines. So I think the A-12 would have been a maintenance nightmare. They needed something more stealthy than the planes that they had on the carrier decks for the Navy. And so, in my view, they overreached by getting an overly sophisticated stealth version, and it was going to be a flying wing design. And the flying wing had a bad history in the uh, B-2 bomber. I had a major general who was retired tell me that if you think the Pentagon is a place for making war plans, you're mistaken. But the real purpose of the Pentagon is to fight for budget share. So the whole thing is this big dance. Do we get our percentage that we typically get? So when the Navy saw the Air Force starting to get all these stealth airplanes, of course it became very jealous because it could see that its role was going to diminish. So it wanted to come up with a stealth airplane. And that's exactly why they wanted to put stealth on the A-6. The Navy uh, issued a contract uh, to two competitors, uh, General Dynamics, teaming with McDonnell Douglas, and then Northrop. They, they said it will be for a 4.8 billion with a B uh, dollar uh, fixed price contract uh, to build some uh, 10 or 12, I can't remember the actual number, uh, of airplanes in a research and development contract. They said these are the prices, this is what it's gonna cost, this is what we're willing to pay for it, et cetera, at no time. At no time did Northrop ever agree to build it for that price. So if you know anything about contract law, if you're not going to adhere to the specifications of the contract, you're really not a competitor. And to keep the charade going that there really was a competition, the Navy kept Northrop in the competition so that McDonnell Douglas and GD would think there was a real competition, which of course is a violation of a lot of things. So that was a charade from the beginning. But in January of 1988, the, the Navy issued a fixed price contract to the team of McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics. So that was a charade from the beginning. General Dynamics did all the design work. McDonnell Douglas was in it just for the navalized aspects of it. Not to say they didn't know anything about stealth, but GD was way down the, the line in terms of development. The uh, contract uh, began in, in January, and in March of 89, a year or so later, uh, Dick Cheney came in the uh, Pentagon as the Secretary of Defense. When the A-12 was uh, being designed, uh, the Air Force did some simulation, and they nicknamed it Bright Star because they said it was so unstealthy. In fact, former Under Secretary of Defense Kaminsky said in one of his depositions that one of the objections to the trailing edge of the airplane was that when you irradiated the, a shape like that, which was the Dorito, the triangular shape, you get a, a, a bloom coming back over the top of the airplane which lights up the radar. So he said it was really not the proper design and that's why on the B-2 and on the competitor from Northrop to the uh, A-12, called, internally called by some A-11, uh, it had a jagged edge, a sort of a sawtooth trailing edge so that the thing wouldn't affect, wouldn't have the problems that uh, Kaminsky mentioned. One of the events that 
uh, happened during 1984 was a German pilot flew a Cessna 182 in the Red Square. He flew it all the way from Helsinki down to uh, Moscow. And for a lot of people, that was evidence that the Russian radar network was porous. Uh, it didn't stick because there's too much money involved. When you have a lot of money involved, contractors say, well, that was just a fluke, and you know, if we were gonna have a bunch of airplanes, they'd light up all the radar sites. So they use whatever excuse they can to justify keeping the money flow. The A-12, they wanted it to make it out of magical materials, boron and uh, fibers and so forth. And that is fine, it's lighter, but they found out that they had to make it so thick that uh, to get the strength they needed, the cost kept climbing up and up. I don't think there's any question that the concept of stealth is valid from at least one position. And you, you can optimize uh, any object to provide less of a radar return. But the problem is, is that it's only good from that one position and everything off of that, say in this case, a, no, a nose on position is a compromise. There's two ways that an airplane is made stealthy. One is by the material that's covering it, which is called radar absorbing material or RAM. And the other is uh, the shape of the airplane. Uh, back in the beginning when, the, when Northrop was competing against the F-117, Lockheed was using flat plates, kind of like one of those mirrored balls you see in a ballroom when the light hits it and it bounces all over the place. You don't get a direct return. And Northrop was trying to solve the problem by smoothing and rounding the edges. And in fact, I demonstrated that to myself one time. Uh, when I was doing research on the book, I went down and interviewed John Cashin, who was the stealth designer of the B-2 and spent several days with him in Australia. And when I came back, I had a laser gun which I was using in a, <clears throat> a radio shack, and I was putting the, the laser all over the store, and I once hit some very curvaceous uh, coverings for what was obviously a, a boombox speaker setup in the back of a truck. And while the, the laser was giving me a return wherever I went all over the store, regardless of color or anything else, when I hit this boombox, which had very compound curves on it, the spot completely disappeared. So I called up Cash in, in Australia and I said, hey, I, I just had an interesting experience today. And he said, you just broke the code. The problem is you can't break the code from all positions. So you, if you want to make the bottom of the airplane stealthy, then something's going to give on the top and vice versa. So it depends on you're coming in low or you're coming in high. So stealth is always a compromise. If you want to think about how radar absorbing material works, think of a of a flashlight, but that only has one color. So the flashlight, let's say it's red, and let's say your airplane is white. Well, if you put a red flashlight on a white airplane, you're gonna see it. But what if the airplane is covered with, uh, let's say velvet that's red, same color as the flashlight. You put the flashlight on it, it's gone. You don't see, there's no reflection. So those two things combined can make an airplane uh, less able to be seen, the F-117 came before anybody else. It, it actually was made its first flight before the, I mean, the A-12 program began. Uh, so it came first, then the F-117 prototypes came along while the A-12 was in its formative years. But the F-117 was the first manned stealth aircraft for the U.S. The F-117 in Serbia uh, had a higher loss rate than the F-16 flying in equally dangerous areas. The F-117, one of them got shot down, which made all the news. What didn't make the news was one of them was shot up so badly it flew back, limped back home, uh, never to fly uh, again during the war. So uh, even with one shot down, it would have a higher loss rate than the F-16 uh, because the F-16 flew a lot more sorties. So a friend of mine went over and interviewed a general after this first uh, shoot down happened. And when he interviewed the general, he brought up the second one and the general said, I don't want to talk about it. So there's no question in my mind that it happened. I've had it confirmed many different ways. Stealth is a concept that's better in the laboratory than it is in actuality. 
Now, what are you going to do to drop a bomb on Russia? You've got a stealth shape, so you're going to open the bomb doors, right? And that's going to give away your position to any basic radar. So I always thought the stealth feature was too expensive for what you got in return. And it's not really invisible. That's a myth. The stealth airplane can be seen on radar if it's close enough. But uh, the, F the F-117, for instance, uh, was the hero, in, in, a, in a sense, of the first Gulf War. But uh, you could see that. And uh, it's good for very precise uh, targets, and uh, but, but it's it's not a Chevrolet or a Ford. Uh, it's a, it's a handcrafted airplane, and the maintenance is a, a devil, and it's not invisible anyhow. But it is less visible than the conventional airplane. Based on an article a friend of mine and I wrote, we were invited to come up to Nellis because the Air Force wanted to show us how great the F-22 was. That we were somehow had been misled and didn't appreciate how stealthy it was. And in one of the, uh, actually it was the first or second series that we watched, uh, an F-5 bagged an F-22. Well, of course, I interrogated, you might call it interrogation, the uh, commanding officer of the uh, squadron that evening. And he said, oh, it was just a fluke. But the point was that there was um, uh, a $360 million airplane against a $20 million airplane. And the point is, how, it shouldn't happen shouldn't happen at all, not being a fluke. He said the pilot was inexperienced. There's always an excuse when it doesn't work. But when they sell it, it works you know, perfectly. The Navy wanted to have a stealth airplane so that when it invaded Russia as part of the war plan, it could make it all the way in and out without being shot down by the, the Russian radar sites. The Russian radar sites were placed every so often, and the idea was that if uh, you had a stealthy airplane, then the radar would only be able to broadcast circles like this and you could fly through these big gaps. Whereas if you were a conventional airplane, the gaps would overlap and you could never get through. Now, Secretary Lehman disagreed with that because he said he had flown in A6s up in the desert where we had captured Soviet radars. And he said we, we demonstrated or the Navy demonstrated to his satisfaction that we could penetrate the Russian radar. Furthermore, the Russians had all these airplanes rusting all over the place and ships, so it was clear the Russians couldn't afford to, to build up more, a more densely populated radar sites, so he thought it was uh, not necessary. The Navy did not have uh, a new airplane, so to speak, so the A-12 was going to be all the bells and whistles that the Air Force was putting in the F-22. Problem is this, that the cost of the F-22 per airplane, counting research and development, is $350 million for one airplane. That means you're in a death spiral on, on procurement. You can't buy enough of them, no matter what, how high the Pentagon budget gets, and it's already about a trillion dollars a year if you count what it costs for homeland defense and what it costs to build nuclear bombs. A trillion is more, more like it than 700 billion. Anyhow, point of story is that um, you can't have an airplane do everything, even though McNamara tried it with the F-111, which was a, the TFX. He wanted to, uh, wanted to be able to bomb, dogfight, have the Air Force buy it, the Navy buy it, the Marine Corps buy it. And uh, specialized roles uh, mean specialized airplanes. And the idea of asking one airplane to do everything uh, just has never proven out. It's not practical. And as I say, if you get an airplane so costly, like the F-22 is $350 million, one airplane, how many of them are you going to be able to buy? Uh, and so there is a strength in quantity as well as in quality. And the uh, Navy pilots were kind of begrudgingly uh, accepting the F-18 E and F, but they really would have liked a new fancy airplane like the A-12. But that's a pilot. You wouldn't expect a pilot not to want the latest weapon that he could get get to fly. I mean, uh, we're all that way in America. <laughs> we, want, we want the latest gadgetry. But uh, from a standpoint of strategy and quantity and ease of maintenance and cost, uh, I just think the uh, F-22 is a loser, and I think the A-12 would have been a loser. Well, 
uh, when our photographer went out to take a picture of it, most of, a good part of it was just uh, pasted, pasted together material. There was not a flyable plane. So I would say they never got more than halfway towards getting a real airplane. And it was a, a, a comical show of this is what it will look like, but it's like an airplane made out of, out of soap or, you know, or a, a, a car when they start out. They carve it first out of a cake of soap. So it didn't get very far, and it certainly was not flight tested at all. Zero, never took off, never landed. And uh, it just, they just couldn't get it strong enough to withstand the landing on a Navy carrier deck. When you have a black program, there are very few people that know what's really going on. In fact, one of the fellows I interviewed was a staff member on the research and development subcommittee. And he said it always amazed him that he knew all about the A-12 program and that 95% of the people on the committee had no clue. The A-12 was designed to carry two missiles internally called TSAM, spelled T-S-S-A-M. But it was so secret that the designers of the A-12 were not allowed to see anything about the TSAM. It was completely compartmentalized. They just were allowed to keep a space for those missiles to be carried in. Well, the contractors do have a point in saying that uh, they were so compartmentalized by the secrecy impositions on them that one guy in one plant couldn't talk to another guy in another plant if he, even if they were working on the same problem because of the secrecy restrictions. So they do have a point in saying that it was overclassified and, uh, you know, scientists and engineers, they love to cross fertilize and that's the way you get things done. But if you've got a secrecy wall, separating you from a guy who knows the answer, uh, that's a legitimate point. And there was a lot of secrecy uh, on, imposed on the A-12. There could have been a certain restriction on the stealth exchange of information that I know about. It was overly classified and you couldn't move to one office to another and talk to a guy without certain uh, permission. The uh, contract uh, began in, in January and in March of 89, a year or so later, uh, Dick Cheney came in the uh, Pentagon as the Secretary of Defense. Well, Cheney in those days, before he got uh, kind of uh, <laughs> over the top about uh, a number of issues when he was uh, Vice President of the United States, but when he was Secretary of Defense, and I covered him at that time, uh, I thought he had a sane approach to things. He was a former uh, White House operative who uh, was deputy to Donald Rumsfeld and lobbying Congress. He, he knew the realities of Congress. Um, but he was a layman. He was not an engineer, never was a pilot. The A-12 had, as every airplane when it's ordered from the Pentagon, has a set of specifications, has a set of performance goals set of performance requirements, has to have a certain speed, has to be a certain weight, has to be able to do certain things, has to be able to go so fast. And uh, it was obvious in the design phase and in the research and development phase that the A-12 was not going to be able to live up to the promised specs. These promised specs are called brochuremanship and you're trying to sell the airplane to the Pentagon and you're, you're, you're saying it can do everything but make cookies and uh, you put a film together and you say this will be a wondrous machine. But when it comes to flying it, uh, they came into all kinds of problems. The Navy saw the Air Force starting to get all these stealth airplanes. Of course, it became very jealous because you could see that its role was going to diminish. So it wanted to come up with a stealth airplane. In my view, they were over ambitious with the uh, uh, design, they were over ambitious with the tech, technical details, and they had more expectations from the stealth than proved realistic. General Dynamics teaming with McDonnell Douglas and then Northrop, they, they said that it will be for a 4.8 billion with a B a dollar uh, fixed price contract. At no time, at no time, did Northrop ever agree build it for that price. If you're not going to adhere to the 
specifications of the contract, you're really not a competitor. The Navy kept Northrop in the competition so that McDonnell Douglas and GD would think there was a real competition, which of course is a violation of a lot of things. So that was a charade from the beginning. By the fall of 1989, the A-12 was exhibiting uh, weight, schedule, and cost problems. So in uh, the fall of 89, after the Berlin Wall fell, Dick Cheney issued a, a memorandum asking for, for people to contribute information to what he called the Major Aircraft Review. He wanted to go up and talk to Congress, since he was a former congressman himself, in uh, April of 1990 and say, here's the state of the contract. Dick Cheney issued a memorandum asking for people to contribute to a uh, presentation he wanted to make the following April 1990, uh, April 26th to be exact. And he asked for these contributors and it took several months and people would contribute information. And about a month before he made his presentation, he got four warnings in writing and verbally that the A-12 was a problem. Uh, one of them was a, uh, a, a briefing, oral briefing, said it was a billion dollars over budget. And since it was a fixed price program, it meant that GD and Mac here would have to pay for that. Cheney has no recollection of that meeting. And according to his undersecretary of defense, when I told him that Cheney said he had no recollection, he said, well, that's impossible. Well, I think that uh the merchants of death out there oversold the A-12 and they said they could deliver on this product which was very fanciful and uh, didn't happen. Because that Under Secretary of Defense, John Betty, had written Cheney uh, a memorandum uh, which also sent to everybody in the, in the upper echelons of the Department of Defense saying of all the airplane programs that you're going to be briefing on April 26th, the A-12 is the only one I have a problem with. And it was his people that briefed Cheney on it being a billion dollars over budget. Whenever there's large amounts of money involved, the Department of Defense has various levels of decision making. And in one of these final decision making, they all agreed they were gonna have a new airplane. The title of my book is called The Five Billion Dollar Misunderstanding. And the reason it's called a misunderstanding is because half the room left thinking it was gonna be a new airplane which was code for stealth, and the other half thought it was going to be an upgraded airplane like the, a, the uh, A6F. Dick Cheney had lots of warnings about the A-12 uh, being a problem, and then when he testified in front of Congress on April 26, he said the A-12 uh, has been well handled to this point. I think the reason that the A-12 was pushed was not so they'd have something that would be a miniature B-2 stealth bomber, for instance, it was more the contractors promising more than they could deliver. And the costs also went skyrocketing. When Cheney decided to terminate the A-12, he called in the Navy and gave them a sort of last chance to tell them why he shouldn't terminate it. They made their arguments and Cheney decided to, to terminate the, uh, the, con the contract. Uh, there was an A-12 program, but the only thing that was in the A-12 program was this contract. So in a sense, you don't terminate a program for default, you can only terminate a contract for default. He didn't say, I'm terminating the contract for default. He said, I'm terminating the A-12. And he later acknowledged it was for the contract. He, he then turned the responsibility over to the Navy's contracting officer, and that officer had a choice between termination for default or termination for the convenience of the government. In one case, the contractor would be paid, and so would the subs, and in the other case, they get nothing. He felt, he being the contracting officer, felt that to let the contractors be paid would be a windfall and was not in the best interest of the government. He wanted to continue the program because he knew how desperately the Navy wanted it. There are several investigations about the A-12 uh, program that happened over the summer of 1990. Uh, in July of 1990, Cheney issued a letter 
to the uh, Senate Majority Leader asking for more money for the A-12. He was denied the money. And from that point on, Cheney and his group of uh, leaders did everything they could to justify the cancellation of the A-12. Remember, they had a war coming up in uh, January of uh, 91, which was against Iraq. So they were looking for money anywhere they could find it. So Cheney uh, canceled the contract and the Navy implemented the cancellation. The contract, uh, if he hadn't canceled it, they would, ha they would have been obligated to issue $553 million, roughly half a billion dollars, against the contract, and they wanted to avoid that because they wanted to use it for other purposes. When Dick Cheney terminated the contract, which he did, which he said he did, he stepped into the shoes of the Navy's contracting officer. That meant he had to follow certain regulations. The uh, regulations require a seven-step process, and that seven-step process takes several months to do. Because this was done over the weekend and the following Monday, $553 million was due to be applied to the contract. It was a rush and it was all done on that Monday. And what they did was, they meaning the contracting officer and his legal assistant, they, they took out an older document that was done to terminate for default the Lockheed P-7, which was a follow-on con concept to the Orion P-3, and they dusted it off and they filled in the blanks with typos, blanks, and inappropriate statements. For example, one of them was they said that the A-12 uh, was being terminated because it couldn't make its runway takeoff length. Well, you don't have a runway takeoff length requirement in an A-12 because it shot off an aircraft carrier with a catapult. And when she was interviewed, this is Peg Olson, when she was interviewed uh, in trial, uh, the attorney asked her, well now, Miss Olson, isn't it reasonable to say that with the slightest amount of review you would have caught these? And she said yes. And the attorney told me it was one of the most sophomoric pieces of work he'd ever seen. So that is what Cheney should have done but didn't do when he terminated the contract for default. He terminated it, well, it's not really fair to say he terminated it for default. He terminated the contract and the Navy's contracting officer acting as a pencil terminated it for default. But that was just fulfilling Cheney's wishes because if he didn't terminate it for default, you'd have to pay out all the money. And that's what they were trying to avoid because the war was coming up in, in just uh, a few weeks. Cheney made false statements to the to the Congress because he said that uh, no one could tell him how much the airplane was going to cost, uh, which is why he terminated the contract. When he made that statement, which was about six weeks after he had done it, he'd, I guess he had forgotten that he was told the day he canceled the contract a very precise number, $7.5 billion is what it would take to finish the program. That, by the way, was the exact number that the Navy used before the program began when it was trying to estimate what it would cost. So Cheney, on many occasions, made statements that were just not true. And again, to accuse somebody of, I'm not accusing him of lying because that means I know what his mental state is, but I can tell you that the statements were false. For example, he wrote a memo to President Bush, the first one, and said, uh, my, my team didn't tell me uh, how bad the A-12 program was. Well, he got four memos on the A-12 program, verbally or in writing, so he knew exactly what it was. In fact, the guy who told Cheney, did you say a billion over, dollars overrun? And uh, Cheney, uh, and the guy answered yes. So Cheney was well briefed on this, so he, he just must have had some sort of disassociation with what he'd been told to be able to say no one could tell me what it was gonna cost. Right after Cheney terminated the contract, uh, of course, the about that was in January and June. The contractors filed a lawsuit, June of 1991. Here we're coming up to 2011. That's 20 years. So why did it take so long? Well, the reason it took so long is because the contractors won at the trial level, and the government kept appealing. Okay? 
And in those appeals, you have wins and losses. And in each case, there was e either a neutral, send it back to the trial for more clarification, or the government won. So finally, the contractors are appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court on one of about 20 reasons. What happens in a contract when people sue each other, they start coming up with excuses. Well, you didn't do this or you didn't do that. So there were a bunch of reasons that the, that the contractor cited as to why they were unable to, to fulfill the contract, most of which I felt were le legitimate. So they get to the Supreme Court and they take out what they think is their best shot. And that was the State Secrets Act. Essentially, the State Secrets Act says this. In order for us, the government, to defend ourselves, we would have to divulge information that is so secret it would harm the country. And therefore, we are not going to proceed. Now, according to, to the legal advice I've been told, the government's perfectly at, uh, at liberty to do that. But if they take that position, then they have to pay the contractors. But in this case, the government is arguing not only do we not have to give you any information so that you can show that you were not at fault, you the contractors, but uh, we're not going to we're not going to tell you anything. We're, we're just not going to give you anything, and so you're going to lose. And there's some argument in the con in the Supreme Court oral argument that hey, that's not really fair. You know, if you're going to if if you're going to do that, then you got to give up the money. You don't have to tell them, but you got to give up the money. You lose. So. The way the contractors get well, this is an old game, everybody who's in Pentagon procurement knows it. They say, well, uh, you changed a thousand things on this airplane and we're going to charge you for each one of those changes. That's how they get well. That's how they make money. <laughs> the basic problem with military procurement in the United States today is that we're allowing the defense contractors, allied with the Congress, to take us to the poorhouse in Cadillacs. So what do the contractors do? That's, that's a severe loss of money if it's, if it's canceled for good cause because it couldn't uh, live up to the specifications in the contract. So they said in the first uh, appeal to the courts, which I covered some of, that uh, he didn't follow pr correct procedures, that he uh, uh, ignored the rules of canceling a contract. So the issue going into the first round, and there's been several rounds in the courts, as you know, um, and it's still not over, that uh, the, the, the polls of the argument were Caney was beyond his authority by the way he canceled the contract. And the Navy's response through the Secretary of Defense was, it couldn't live up to the uh, contract uh, performance-wise, specifications-wise, so it's a flawed product and we're not going to buy it. So we have just cause for canceling a contract because it can't perform as advertised. The contractors fall back, McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics was, yeah, but there's certain ways that you have to cancel a contract and there's certain appeal processes and you ignored all those rules. So that was the issue. Looking through uh, uh, Defense Secretary Cheney's end of the telescope, I can see why he couldn't get answers to A, no one knows what it's going to cost, B, knows, no one knows what it will be able to do, C, nobody knows whether it can withstand the pressures of a carrier deck. And what was the threat? Who had an A-12? Nobody. Uh, and you could make a case nowadays, why not deal with it with unmanned aircraft and then send in something simpler and cheaper than the A-12. Cheney couldn't get uh, solid answers, and he just said, to hell with it, cancel it. And he went out to St. Louis and canceled it on the spot. The history of the Department of Defense is that all programs run into problems, and there was nothing unique about the A-12. There was no reason to think that it wouldn't continue. I mean, historically, programs get into problems, they throw money at it, and it either gets fixed or it doesn't get fixed, but in most cases, it continues whether it's fixed or not. The A-12 program was doomed to failure from the very beginning for the simple reason that not enough money was funded for the airplane, for the development of the airplane. The 4.8 was less 
than the 6.8 that was appropriated for just one phase of the F-22. Basically, all airplanes in development go through three phases. At the time, they hit the first phase was called concept formulation, where you have a bunch of paper studies. The second phase was uh, demonstration and validation portion of the advanced tactical fighter, which eventually became the F-22. Both Northrop and Lockheed developed airplanes. They each contributed two airplanes. One was called the YF-23, that was the Northrop airplane. One was called the YF-22, that was the Lockheed airplane. The combined amount of money spent on that phase of the airplane was a significant amount more than was, than was programmed for the entire A-12 program. So you have these three phases, concept formulation, demonstration and validation, and then full-scale development. That's when you build the actual airplanes and start flying what's supposed to be the end product. There was never enough money in the A-12 program. It was doomed because there wasn't enough money, and everybody knew it. Everybody I ever interviewed said everybody knew it was doomed, but like all programs, they thought they were gonna get whole on production. So when uh, Dick Cheney, when he gave his talk on April 26, 1990, the major aircraft review, he basically cut the program in half. So there was no way they were gonna get whole. So the contractors came and talked to Dick Cheney in June and said, we can't get there from here. We don't, there's not enough money. And Cheney had some options, but he doesn't even remember that conversation either. So it wasn't until July that he asked for more money. Congress didn't give it to him. So the A-12 program never had enough money to adequately do what needed to be done. When you're talking about research and development, you don't really know what you don't know. You don't really know when things are gonna happen. So if you came to me and said, how much would I charge to do something I had never done before? I'd say, I don't know, I'll just bill you hourly until I get there. Uh, a friend of mine once said, uh, inspirations come, but not on schedule. So that's what uh, Tom Jones told me when I interviewed him about his part of the A-12 competition. He said, we built stealth airplanes. We knew what the problems were. We knew that you could never make a fixed price contract for a research and development airplane because you don't know. So he thought it was just ludicrous. So that's why he made his so expensive that they were never really considered a competitor because he didn't want to end up losing money. So he essentially converted his proposal from fixed price to a cost plus. And that's why the A-12 was never gonna be built because it, would, it didn't have enough money in the first place. If you look at the F-22 program, you had the middle phase, the demonstration and validation. That was probably 20 or 30% more than the whole A-12 program. And since then, they spent uh, probably in today's dollars, 15 or $20 billion. The A-12 program was premised on the fact that the Air Force was going to share information with the Navy. Uh, that was done in two ways. One, it was uh, in the specification, which was incorporated into the contract, that the Air Force would give the information. And secondly, there was a memorandum of understanding between the Secretary of the Air Force and the Secretary of the Navy that they would share information. That information was never shared. It was asked for many times. It was never forthcoming. So that meant that the contractors who had never been cleared into any stealth programs were not able to use if they had some personal knowledge about stealth, they were not able to use it because they had to justify the basis on which they were building the airplane. So it would be kind of like a blind man trying to tell you what the inside of a cave looked like and he can't touch the walls. There's just no way to figure out how to do it. So they ran down a bunch of blind alleys, but towards the end, they actually started getting closer and closer. There is a duty, according to uh, many of the lawyers that I've talked to on the program, a famous case called Helene Curtis that says that a government can not remain silent and allow a contractor to enter into a ruinous course when the, when the government has the information. They have a duty to share it. And when the judge in the first trial looked at the contract, he said, you have a duty to share it based on the specification. Never happened. 
Well, just to back up on the realities of contracting, when Robert S. McNamara came to office at the Pentagon as Secretary of Defense in 1961, there was a competition for what was then called the Tactical Fighter Experimental, TFX, which became the F-111. And they had three separate competitions for the first time uh, McNamara had uh, demanded that uh, the, the competing contractors who were then Boeing and General Dynamics um, share each other's information after every competition of those three different uh, awards, the three different competitions. And so it's standard practice that once you're bidding for a government contract and you have some technical information that would help your competitor, there, the Pentagon has the right under most contracts to tell, tell uh, X what Y knows that he doesn't know. And so it would be unusual for a contract uh, where taxpayers' money is being spent for the F-117 people not be able to talk to the A-12 people. But it could have been. I don't know that for a fact. But the standard practice is you share information because it's all owned by the government. The reason that the Air Force did not share the information, uh, in my opinion and the opinion of many other people, is that we're back to the budget share problem. The Air Force, missions and budget share. The Air Force wants to have it all. The Navy wants to have it all. Anybody who doubts this, all they have to do is go back and look at the uh, carrier battles back in right after World War II. The Air Force said, we don't, you don't need to give money to the Navy because with our B-36 that's coming online, we can drop nuclear bombs all over the world at a moment's notice, so the Navy is irrelevant. The Navy, on the other hand, argued, well, you may not always want to eviscerate your enemy. You may just want to kick him in the toe, and that's when you need the, air, the uh, aircraft carrier. So there's always been this rivalry and jealousy between the services, and they guard like you can't believe their budgets, and they will not do anything to cooperate with each other. Northrop didn't share their technology with uh, the A-12 team because, after all, it would be like a competitor sharing with another competitor. They were competitors. So the Air Force didn't want to do it based on just parochial interests, and Northrop wasn't going to share because they were a competitor in the program. First of all, what happens in the real world is contractors have to make a living, right? So they're always trying to sell the better mousetrap. And they're continually promising things they cannot deliver on. The, uh, they can't deliver on cost, they can't deliver on performance. And the reformers that I respect say, why not have a fly before buy? Why not compete two airplanes against each other and see which one is better. Let's, let's forget about all this brochuremanship from the contractors who have a vested interest in selling the airplane. And uh, it's never, it's always uh, talked about, but it's never really uh, put into practice. And there's, the, the specs never are fulfilled. Even the C-17, which is a very uh, popular transport airplane, never lived up to its original specs. Towards the end, when it was clear that the a-12 was not going to um, stay. Uh, the Navy tried to show that it was still a valid concept. And so if, if you were to sit in those meetings, they were meeting all the goals that the Navy had set up for, not necessarily the first goals that they set in the contract, but the ones the Navy sort of caved in on over time. The Navy wanted this airplane desperately. It was a, it was a love-hate relationship. The A-12 program was so secret that when I showed a document to former Vice Admiral Robert Dunn, who was in charge of the aviation operational side in the Navy, I put the document down. He picked the document up, he looked at it, he looked at me, and he looked at it and he looked at me, he looked at it again and he looked at me and he said, you know, when I signed this, I never thought it would see the light of day. He said, I should have listened to my good friend, and he named his friend. He said, never sign anything unless you expect to see it on the front page of the Washington Post. And that document that he signed was basically telling someone he wanted to work back channel, that he didn't want to have to divulge this information to the Congress, 
for fear that Congress would shut down the program when it started running into problems in the very beginning. It wasn't in the mind of Herb Fenster, the attorney that represented the A-12 team, or at least the GD component of it. Admiral Dunn's failure to notify the Congress was the single most duplicitous act in the entire A-12 program. At the first trial, the uh, contractors won. And they won because they were suing the Navy, saying that you failed to terminate the contract properly. You failed to follow the seven steps. The judge agreed, awarded the contractors by, by changing it from termination for default to a termination for convenience. The Navy said, or should I say, the Justice Department lawyers representing the Navy, they said, oh, wait a minute, Judge, we can show uh, egregious default. In other words, they first said, well, they were, there was criminal activity, and the judge says, well, show me the criminal activity. And they said, well, we can't find that, but we can show you egregious behavior, which they call the egregious default trial. So for about a year, that went on. And the only thing that the Navy could show was that the contractors were overweight by 704 pounds. And of course, that was ludicrous because there have been many other programs that have been overweight far, far more than that that are still flying today. The A-12 began life with unappropriated money. What that means is that the prohibition in the Constitution, which says the executive branch cannot spend money unless Congress has approved it, spend it anyway. And the way the Navy got around it was it has a lot of black programs, and it would take these black programs and put it into a big pool, kind of like a uh, winemaker. At, instead of going to the Naval Air Systems Command, where the money should have gone, where it was appropriated to, it went to the Naval Supply Systems Command and to a fund. And in that fund, they mixed the money together like, a, like they're blending wine, like the French do, and then they would ladle out the money wherever it was needed. And this was found out because there was a label left on some of that money that said it was for another purpose. So that was one of the counts in the ultimate lawsuit. So the unappropriated money doesn't really uh, slow down the military services if they want to violate the law. And it is a felony to violate the law because Congress in the early 1800s was getting all these bills for things that never approved. So Congress got tired of that and decided to make it a felony. And have you ever heard of anyone being prosecuted for that? I haven't. Some people ask me, who is the villain in this case? What they don't understand is the way decisions are made in the Department of Defense. All, most of these decisions are group decisions. That way, everybody shares the blame and there's nobody that they can point the finger at. It's this fungibility of, of responsibility. Nobody's responsible. There was a decision made, which again, each of you have used the word we. Was it put in writing, Admiral Morris? Yes or no? Somewhere, you all have used the we, and we're going to find out who we is. And whose, her staff. Whose decision was it to make? Was the, it your decision? Whose decision was it? Now, in the case of Cheney, he is responsible for canceling the contract just a few months after he said it was well handled and he asked for more money for it. So the reason he canceled it is obviously not because it wasn't well handled. He would said it was, unless he was lying. It's not because he didn't ha uh, because he, he had the money. He didn't have the money, so he, ha he had to make a decision. What am I going to do? So he canceled the program so he could get them out of the picture, get them terminated for default, free up the money for the war. And by the way, right after that, he allowed the contractors to not pay up. They had an agreement in which the contractors could defer paying the billion dollars that they owed or whatever the amount was, which is unheard of. It's no precedent for it. They still haven't paid any money. They're supposed to pay when you get terminated for default and then come back and collect it. There are uh, the, question, the question is, what did the contractors actually deliver? Well, in their contract, there's a whole bunch of line items, and they delivered most all of that. After the contract was 
terminated, there was a video taken that I saw that showed all the parts that have been made. And you can basically see all the parts for an airplane. You could have put an airplane together with, I would say almost a complete airplane with all those parts that were there. So it isn't as though they didn't do anything. Well, one of the big problems they ran into was curing the laminates that they were using with the special approach to building airplanes, which wasn't out of metal. It was out of composites. Well, who knew about that, term, that technology? Northrop knew about it. Lockheed knew about it. The Navy didn't know about it. They could have told them in a heartbeat how to do it, but it was too late. The Navy is invoking the State Secrets Act, which I find somewhat ironic because when Under Secretary of Defense Kaminsky was asked in his deposition, is there any technology from the A-12 program that uh, is viable that you can use, that's something that the, the government or the, the people can use? He said, no, not really. So here they're arguing about state secrets over an airplane where the Undersecretary of Defense, who is a specialist in stealth, says there's nothing in the A-12 program we need. The A-12 case, after 20 years, is now in the Supreme Court. They had oral argument in January of 2011. And one of the ironies is that when the A-12 contractors were ready to file their lawsuit, they talked to the government and said, uh, tell you what, we won't sue you if you don't sue us. We'll just walk away. So here we are 20 years later. We're in the Supreme Court, and the argument is based on the State Secrets Act, which legally means the following. It means that the government, if it wants to invoke the State Secrets Act, is supposed to pay the contractors because it's for the privilege of taking the State Secrets Act. One lawyer I talked to, Herb Finster, who was the first attorney for the Mac Air G GD team, said that a case called Windstar requires that they pay the contractors if they're going to invoke the State Secrets Act. What I found ironic was Justice Scalia argued Gee, that doesn't seem fair. Why don't you guys just walk away with what you've got now? So the whole thing has come around after 20 years to that being one of the arguments. And that I don't know what's gonna happen, but whatever happens, the taxpayer lost in the end. For years, the McDonnell Douglas company had been trying to sell the Navy an airplane they called the Hornet 2000, which was an airplane that was bigger than the F-18 C and D, uh, but it was going nowhere. Towards the end of the, the A-12 program, uh, there was an argument being made that we should probably just stop the A-12 and put the money into the F-18 uh, Hornet 2000, which was then being called the F-18E. There was a big meeting, study was done, and the study concluded that there's no way that the F-18E could do the job of the A-12 because you'd have to put RAM, this radar absorbing material, over all of its weapons which hang externally, and that it was absolutely inadequate for the job. The second that the A-12 program was canceled, they dusted off that Hornet 2000 slash F-18E and said, oh, this is the answer, because the Navy is paranoid about not having its aircraft carriers. And if they don't have an airplane, they don't have a justification for deep strike, which they call it, bombing the enemy way internally. Then they have no justification for the carrier, and then basically the Navy has no justification for an air wing. So that's, that was their very sensitive spot. So the airplane that they were bad-mouthing uh, a month previously, a month later, they were saying, this is the answer, we can do this. And by the way, they violated all kinds of internal rules, getting that, getting that appropriated by just bypassing the rules that are required to justify the airplane in the first place. They say the F-18 is just a remake of the old F-18. It's frankly 80% all new. The F-18 E and F, as one admiral put it to me, is good enough. And there is, as I say, uh, a point where if you have an airplane too expensive, you can't buy enough of them to justify the carriers. Well, the F-18 E and F, uh, is plenty good enough for the threat out there. And it's easier to maintain uh, than would have been 
the A-12. And yes, uh, all pilots like to go fast and have fancy gadgetry in their airplane. But when you look at who's got any sophisticated airplanes out there, where, where is the threat? I mean, they talk about China, but China has only got a minuscule air force. They talk about Russia. Russia is more bankrupt than we are. So in my view, what fails to be done is to justify a new product on the basis of an enemy, a potential enemy threat. That was never done, and it's, it's never done. It's become uh, a kind of a gee whiz game to how, how can I make it more sophisticated, more, more, uh, more complicated. But I think it's time to call time out and say, hey, look, we're putting airplanes on a carrier. There's all kinds of uh, corrosion problems. There's all kinds of training problems. Uh, you got to land at night. You got to land in rough seas. What are we doing here with all this fancy stuff that uh, is marginally uh, uh, important? So, uh, you know, they keep talking about automating carriers and then they say, well, how do you fight a fire, which is the biggest single threat on an aircraft carrier? You get 5,000 kids on an aircraft carrier and if something catches fire, um, it could be a very explosive. And so every time they talk automation of a carrier to save money, they always end up saying, well, you need the firefighting capability, so we still got 5,000 people on a carrier. And it's very manpower intensive. It's a human wave attack to run a carrier. And same way with the planes. You've got amateurs out there on the flight deck who are doing very dangerous work, working their tails off 18 hours a day. Um, let's give these kids a break by making things less complicated. The aircraft carrier is the heart of the naval fleet. And you have to ask yourself the question, though, if you can't afford enough airplanes to justify 11 aircraft carriers, what are you going to put out there? So uh, you're shooting yourself in the foot, in a sense, by having an airplane so expensive you can't afford to buy enough of them to fill up the decks of the carrier. And uh, the, the, the uh, present Secretary of Defense in our country, Bob Gates, has said, we've got 11 aircraft carriers, and nobody else has more than one. And he made the point that that's a ridiculous ratio, but he said, quote, I'm not crazy. In other words, Congress loves the aircraft carriers too because the Navy's been lobbying for them forever. And so uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a point of it's reaching a point of diminishing returns when you have an aircraft carrier which costs 30 to 40 billion dollars. When I first started covering defense, it was three billion. <laughs> and you got a cruise missile which can disable the flight deck, which is all you have to do. You don't have to sink the carrier to put it out of service. I mean, what good is a carrier if it can't deliver ordnance on the target? What good is a carrier if it doesn't have airplanes it can take off? And so all you have to do is use a million dollar cruise missile, surface to surface cruise missile, to disable the flight deck of a carrier for weeks. So you put it out of action, and what, what, what good is it going to do you off Libya, for instance, if they hit it with a surface to surface missile? So the whole mix is, to my mind, in need of a strategic review as opposed to this rubber stamping of what we're already doing, which is the quadrennial defense review which Congress has mandated they do every four years. But it's a piece of boilerplate. It just justifies what we're doing. We really need a rigorous review of where we're going on defense. And to save money, uh, I think Obama made a terrible mistake by uh, giving uh, defense a free pass and saying, we're going we're to cut everything but defense. And then he backed off and said, well, defense is on the table too. But Congress is not going to cut defense budget because, they A, they don't want to look weak on defense. B, they don't care whether their weapon works right or, or not, as long as it provides jobs in their home area. So we're in a military industrial complex that doesn't make sense, in my view. Well, you know, one of the good things that Defense Secretary Robert McNamara did, he proved before Vietnam drowned him and, jo and Lyndon Johnson as well, that a dollar put in the civilian economy provides more jobs than a dollar put in a weapon. And 
uh, that's the way he closed surplus bases. And I think we need to go back to sobering up and uh, stop being on this high-tech binge we're on, A, to save money, and B, to get over the idea that uh, any dollar spent in my home area as a politician is good for me because it promotes jobs. That same dollar put into highways or education would have more of a return. And he sold that concept early on in the 60s, but we've lost sight of it. And uh, the fact that we're spending a trillion dollars a year on national defense makes no sense at all to me. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.